All right, I'm Michael, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thank you. All right, so we got a lot to we got a lot to talk about. Let me just read, read a little introduction because I want people to really understand your background and what we're about to talk about. And so Michael, Michael Potts is a, uh, a design holograph architect and with a degree in architecture and emphasis on advanced visualization technology. And he's capable of not only creatively inventing new designs, but, but qualified to generate custom presentations and VR experiences and environments and animated stories to allow businesses to experience designs and ideas in a whole new way. And we've been playing around a lot with VR and, and talking about the application for our business IT leaders and what they can use VR for moving, moving forward. But you've been involved in a number of prominent projects, including LA Live, improvements at the Alamo, the MGM National Harbor, the State Department buildings, high-speed trains, hyperloops, and you've done over 3,000 projects in five continents. And so your, your work has been seen in dozens of publications, including broadcast television and motion picture. And you currently lead the offices of M2, M2 Studio in Dallas, Texas. And so I, I think this is really good to talk about your 21 years of experience, Michael, and and as it really starting out as in the architecture side of the physical architecture and how you've really moved to create these all immersive experiences for marketing and presentations and business enablement. So um, is there anything I can add to your introduction? Do you think that covers it all? That's pretty, that's pretty good um, description. And, and I appreciate you mentioning the, the, the most of the past 21 years has been in architectural engineering, architecture and construction. And, but we've definitely pivoted to a ton of different markets and different clients and customers. Do you think that gives you an advantage in the uh, virtual world, having uh, that background in architecture? I think it gives us an edge in a certain area, right? Like we're going to be more experienced at producing environments and, in, and spaces and buildings, uh, parks and stuff like that. And, and, and fortunately, over those 21 years, there's been a lot of variation. And it's not just been strictly architecture. So we did a titanium dredge, for example. We had to get into the complications of this uh, mechanism, and we've done you know, wastewater treatment facilities and uh, uh, data, data, uh, data centers. And uh, we worked on a anti-terrorism facility for the Air Force. So over those 21 years of doing this and 3,000 projects, there's been so many different um, kind of like offshoots of straight architecture that you've been learn I've learned a lot of different um, industries and technologies. So one of the things that I think a, a lot of folks are, you know, we, we've just gone through an event where we learned about Web 3.0 and the importance of where we think VR and AR really right around kind of the 1995, I like to call it 95, 96 timeframe when the real internet became available to people through the browser, the Netscape wars with Netscape and Microsoft with Bill Gates at that time really battling for internet supremacy. But once the, it, once it became useful, usable on a on a um, on a regular 286 386 pc now we could get the human race involved in the internet versus just kind of the military or, or or sort of pure geeks where do you think we are right now with with vr and web 3.0 and augmented reality yeah well you know i've, I've done my history because i wanted to make sure i knew where the origins came from virtual reality was originally kind of came up in the 1960s with the navy and uh, they developed a virtual reality device. It went through some universities. There was, you know, various uh, technologies that were kind of, you know, developing. But if we're looking at a technology that really has been around for 60 years, um, it's it's taken a while, you know. And there have been uh, some uh, times when there was the hype was big, and everyone said this is the time when virtual reality is going to be huge. And that was the first time that really happened was in the mid 90s, and it just didn't del deliver. Uh, again, uh, I got, uh, you know, started with virtual reality in the mid 90s, at 96, I had my first headset. And, and then again, in 2005 and 2006, I went in again and said, this is it, this is time. I invested $100,000, bought a $30,000 headset, really nice tracking system, a bunch of computers. And I was just looking through my bio the other day, just uh, trying to look at some old stuff. And I realized that I was bragging a decade ago, actually, yeah, a decade ago, that we had the same VR headset that NASA and JPL and all these big companies had. But it, it, to answer your question, there have been series of a series of kind of hyped expectations and then sort of disappointments, and that's and that's happened uh, I think really kind of over the last several decades. So where are we now? 
it's finally catching up. I think the technology is finally ca catching up to the hopes and the aspirations. And someone like myself with 25 years in this, you know, playing with virtual reality, working with virtual reality, to see it finally become uh, an effective tool and companies saying, okay, we, we've, we want to use this and we've used it and it's working. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, it feels great. So I think this is the, um, in the analogy of like the smartphone, I think that we're right around the time when um, uh, the iPhone one came out or the iPhone two came out right there. When now, it was like a, when it was more of an iPod at the time, like a it, music. It, gathering it didn't device. have all the features, but it was it was revolutionarily different than the Trio or the or earlier devices, the Blackberries that you didn't have the touch screen. It didn't have a really good integrated camera. The operating system didn't work as you know seamlessly. The brain didn't make the same connections it it did with the iPhone one. And of course, as each each year came went along in the last. Uh, 14 years, it's gotten better and better and better. And now it's it's just an, a, a marvel, right? I think we're there. I think we're at that, we crossed that point from it being a, a cool gadget to it has a function, it works, it's effective. The uh, Oculus Quest 2, as far as, as far as VR goes, I think is the, is the, is the best headset for the money by far. Nothing can really touch it. Now there's com complaints about this or that, but it's a great device. But Mark Zuckerberg just announced last week they're working on the Oculus Quest 3 and the Oculus Quest 4 right now. So that just tells you that we are in that stretch now where there's going to be a regular improvement every, you know, I don't know, every nine to 18 months with a new updated piece of hardware that's going to improve it. And, uh, and so it's, I think we're at that stage. We're at that, yeah. it's, it's inflecting up and it's going to continue to go up for a while. And I don't think it's going to go back down. No, I think the pandemic probably uh, accelerated that as well. Um, probably gave it a five-year boost in, in many right. respects. Um, I mean, would you think so? Uh, it's moved much faster, much yeah. faster. And and at the beginning, before the pandemic was really going, we were. I was actually more interested in the Hololens and ah, the, yeah. Unreal, the the AR solution. And I love these these glasses from Unreal. Um, they're just you know they're just little glasses. They yeah. They, they, and you can. Put them in your coat pocket, pull them out, and you don't have to tell anyone, you know, press this button or whatever. It's very, very intuitive. The problem was COVID changed the the kind of the, the dynamics that you, you had to get in person and make a presentation or bring four or five people together to really appreciate this in the same room. And COVID changed that. So it pushed VR to a higher prominence. And I think that's going to stay that way for a while because now all of a sudden you've all these use cases, all these opportunities for VR. But eventually, I think the AR will catch back up and may probably surpass it. Um, uh, Apple has announced that they'll have an a, a AR headset in a few years, and that'll be interesting to see. You know, Koka said that it's the most important, and in, in Zuckerberg, it said, you know, it's the biggest source of investment, one of the largest sources of investment in Facebook and Apple right now. And aren't they going to have like Ray-Bans? Isn't there like a partnership? Isn't Ray-Ban partnering with them? to take the Oculus and essentially embed it in the, in the eyeglasses? Yeah, I think the long term, that's the plan, is that there'll be uh, a, a pair of sunglasses or glasses that'll have everything. I, I want to say, from what I remember watching and reading on Facebook, by the way, I just talked to the guy at the, the, the Facebook AR uh, uh, team, and he wants to connect. So I'm super excited about that, because I don't know where that's going to go. But um, uh, I think the first iteration that Facebook is doing is going to have a pair of Ray-Bans that have collection information, so it'll collect uh, yeah. the data. I don't believe that they're quite to the point where they're ready to project the data onto the glasses. I mean, there there are systems that will do that, and there are small, tiny projectors, but I want to say that I remember reading the Facebook's first iteration is simply going to be a data collection, so it'll probably be more like a beta program. You'll sign up. You'll agree to do this. You'll collect data for them. They'll use it for all different kinds of purposes, but eventually the plan is just to incorporate a heads-up display. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I talk a lot about with the, with the innovation in, in, group, the, in my group about those things that we, I wish there was a better word than poo poo, but those things that we disrespect up front or that we say we're never going to do, like we're never going to text people when texting came out. We're never going to use Facebook when Facebook came out. We're never right. going to use Instagram. We're not going to buy anything on our phone. Like we always say never. And I like, when we remember the Blackberry, I was just watching an old movie last night and it wasn't that old, but they were had like you were using blackberries and yep. remember that you could depress the uh the the, the actual physical dig, uh numbers and yeah. you could feel it click and yeah. i'm like and then all of a sudden the iphone came out and it was like without you couldn't feel it and i was like there's just no way i'm i'm gonna move to the iphone i want to feel that depression of that right. of that keystroke and i and i'm uh and, and which parts of vr do you think fit into that mold right now 
Well, I mean, I remember just reading something, the same, same story just a little bit ago, how they dismissed, uh, I don't know who it was, but it dismissed the, uh, mm. uh, the iPhone because of that same issue. That's this issue where you're not having the texture, the feel, yeah. the buttons pushing them down. Now, look, there's a lot of uh, different areas in which AR and VR need to improve. And, and, and th there, you could assume that could be a very long, long path before it's just you know, a, a marvel that we all just use as ubiquitous as anything. But the biggest improvements probably need to come into, um, you know, uh, the visual acuity of the image, the field of view. That's going to be big for both the AR and the VR. Um, the processing power, which the good, the good thing on that is it's constantly getting better. The processing power is constantly improving, just following Moore's law. But uh, when we were in, just in alt space a little bit ago, you know, we had these avatars and you've seen the avatars now in a couple different platforms. I've seen them in maybe, I don't know, nine or 10 different platforms. One of the things that will, that's coming soon, and I would say in the next 18 months or, or less, uh, the avatars themselves will become more realistic, more expressive. Okay. And part of that is with uh, tracking in the headset. Both Zuckerberg and the recent uh, HTC solution has got a face tracker, mouth tracker in there. And Zuckerberg mentioned that that's what they're gonna incorporate. And that really will be a big deal because then you'll start to catch a person's facial expression if they're frowning or smiling or uh, you know giving all kinds of, of visual cues on their face, but also the mimicking of the mouth when someone's speaking yeah, will be yeah. much more accurate. And from that, you can start to use artificial intelligence to start to kind of reconstruct where like where their their eyes might squint and other information based on eye tracking and mouth tracking. So I think where you're going to see shortly is the avatars be much more expressive and. Um, probably something between uh, the alt space where there's a little bit more of a character and the spatial where they're photorealistic, probably going to use a bit of both where you'll scan in your photograph, it'll produce a really nice, you know, kind of like a cleaned up version of your face. But then using these new advances in, in the, the eye tracking and the mouth tracking to create an avatar face that just looks much more like the real person. Yeah, I mean, for those of you listening, so Michael's building, um, he's going to be building a, uh, a community for my CIOs and also my board and also virtual uh, uh, working collaboration space for disparate workforce. So, you know, one of the, we've been, he's taking me on a tour of spatial.io's uh, platform and which has these, uh, it tries to replicate a reasonable facsimile of a human being in a uh, virtual format. So it's trying to mimic a real uh, real life avatar. And then we were in alt space, which I was really surprised with Michael. I, the alt space, uh, the, he set up a St. Patrick's Day themed, um, his team set up a St. Patrick's Day themed uh, event that was very, very cool. But I actually enjoyed those characters. Like the characters to me weren't, didn't off put. I, I was like, wow, this is, might be even better than a full, full human being face. Right. But I think that's I think that's one of the things the future is going to be, uh, you know, the avatars. And then the question is, do you want to represent yourself uh, or do you want to take on a role of somebody else? Do you want to be Al, Al Pacino? Do you want to look like, um, you know, a character from a from a Star Wars movie or from a children's movie? Those are the things that we'll get to, you know, kind of make those decisions and different platforms are going to affect uh, your ability to do that. But uh, no question, the hardware just keeps getting better and better. And if I've, if I've taken 25 years to watch it, the one thing I would tell you is, you know, I have a pair of, head, a pair of glasses I paid like said $30,000 for. This is $300 and yeah. it's wireless and it's um, a much better resolution, much more power. And, and just so this, to see the difference of one one hundredth of the cost and at the same time, probably 100%, well, maybe considerably better resolution, considerably better graphics, tracking and all of that so where it's going it's just going to get better and better and better yeah i've been i've been really stunned by it because um you know we you and i both were at an event that was run in in virtual reality it was an innovation event and and just even today that saint patrick's thing i i i love the i know they're, they're also planning more haptic uh sensation from fingers and and, and tactile sensation right and you had built those guinness bottles of beer mm -hmm. just the functional reaching down to grab that beer, you know, and have that tactile. And then, it, it, you know, it, it is a real immersive, it's an immersive feel, even though I didn't have all the tactile sensations yet, it's immersive. Yeah. And I, and I, and I've had about give or take 500 meetings in virtual reality since this time last year, I started doing 
spatial uh, in probably February of 2020. Uh, and it's, I didn't ha- did not have too many uh, Zoom calls until maybe the summer of last year. So by the time I started doing Zoom calls, I was already having had, a let's say, 100 meetings in virtual reality. And it's a, just a, some completely different experience. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. It's really hard to put it into words. But the best way I can describe it is you feel a presence that you're in the room with somebody else, that your brain just sort of just accepts it, that there's another person there or people standing around you that you just can't get. And unless you're in virtual reality. So the Zoom calls are great and it's a nice experience. And I certainly can see I'm talking to you and I can see your expression immediately, but I don't feel like I'm in the same room with you. Yeah. When I'm in, and when I'm in a space or an environment, um, I can be in the room with people from all over the world. And it's just, hi, where are you from? Oh, you're from, you're from Japan and you know, you're from Ireland and you just, you feel like you're all in the same space. So yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing experience, but it's hard to communicate that to people. So one of the big things we talk about is innovation projects, you know, and, and standing, standing, uh, standing uh, projects up fast to test the, the use case for them. And where are you finding business leaders right now are wanting to test out and engaging you to, to deploy and, and, and test different concepts they have of use, of use cases? Where, where, where are you seeing like the top three use cases being you know, I'm getting it all over the place, truthfully. Uh, it's interesting. Your situation is not incredibly uncommon. Someone wanting to have uh, an environment to hold meetings, to have, uh, to bring in executives, to have private conversations, to have a more, you know, a, a, a more uh, enhanced uh, collaboration conversation. And so that's one of the areas for sure. Um, some people are asking us to just replace their offices. Just, can you build a digital copy of my office? Because we want to show uh, future employees, what this is, what, what our office looks like. We want to make it more comfortable for our existing employees. So they'll go into the space and they'll recognize, oh, we're in the conference room that we normally in, but they're all in their own homes. Um, uh, and, and, but then, you know, there's all across the board, different, different applications. I mean, I'm hearing universities using it for uh, teaching, for training, for incorporating uh, the students into their, into different classrooms. I just had a conversation. I will you really sh- shocked that I had a conversation, but it was about two weeks ago. I talked to uh, the representative from the Federal Reserve, wanting okay. to use uh, augmented reality to use to show um, nested digital uh, uh, animated data visualization. And it makes a lot of sense because once you can see and share that experience, the brain picks up the information and understands it so much better in a three-dimensional format than looking at a two-dimensional screen. So nested, now, so it's basically like a pivot chart in a 3D. Uh, think, think of it like this. Think of it like you, you look down at a map, right? A three-dimensional map of the United States and you tap on Texas. I'm in, I'm in Texas, I'm in East Texas. You tap on Texas and it pulls out, okay, here are the home values in these five cities. And then you can tap on the city and it breaks it out into this is the, the home values that sold last year that were appraised at you know, this, this price, this price, and this price. Okay, now let's go into one level higher. Where, where are these, you know, what, what do the zip codes look like? Uh, where are the, you know, so basically a series of, of nested information and you can just touch them, like you reach out and touch it and then boom, it'll bring up more information. So, I mean, that's one way uh, uh, an oil company is talk to, talking to us about doing um, essentially building duplications of their oil fields in virtual reality so they can send their experts into the uh, digital copy of the oil field that will have readouts from the various equipment that are sent like to a, to a satellite uh, read that they can then look at the readouts in their virtual place and so they're all in different places and share that experience together. Um, so applications all over, right? Just all different kinds of ways to use it. Oh, wow. Well, so what, what the two platforms we've been talking about is Altspace and virtual uh, I.O. And spatial, spatial I.O. Spatial I.O. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and then sp- is there spatialweb.net as well? Or is that? There's a spatial web, which is a web-based version of it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not connected to the same company, but it's called spatial.web. And that's um, a three-dimensional model that you can traverse with a video camera. So it's kind of like Zoom and VR connected to each other. Yeah, when I experienced that, it was it was definitely like a like my head was surround it, it, it was in a Zoom experience, but you can move it around the screen in in, in a in a world. It's a different um, experience. But your peop, you're primarily being asked for like spatial.io and and altspace, correct? Those are yeah, really, we're get, we're getting a, a few requests to do another another platform called Engage. Engage and okay. Engage is a, a large uh, very 
it's, it's a more established uh, program that a lot of businesses have been using for conferences and education. And then we, because we come from architecture, our first entrance into this multi-user experience was a program called The Wild. And The Wild is uh, really a great program. It's quite predominantly used by architects and people in the, in the uh, design profession, interior designers, engineers. Okay. And we just recently, not too long ago, built a, a, a 18,000 square foot home for a client who, who uh, really wanted to walk around in this home and it, and really understand what it was going to feel like to be in all the different rooms of four stories on the rooftop deck and the, you know the kitchen the bedrooms and all that stuff and walk around it in virtual reality and that platform we used uh, the wild which was a great platform and and for those who who didn't have VR headsets they could watch on the web and for those who wanted to experience it in virtual reality they could go in virtual reality. So you could take a space uh, a company space let's say their conference room or some iconic part of their building. Um, and then you could create that if you had a, a picture of it and, and render it in a three-dimensional, uh, and so people can get it and they sort of associate that with the business space, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we've got a you know a comp- company in Israel who just last week asked to do exactly the same thing. Just here are photographs, here are some dimensions, recreate this in- environment. And so they don't have all the architectural drawings, but we do have some dimensions and photographs. And my team is, you know, they're very good at that kind of stuff. So you'll create the depth and the width and all of the, uh, and you can, you essentially be able to render that in in a um, in, in a three D. Yeah, and the scale will be the same. I mean, within a you know within a fraction of an inch or so. Um, but if you were to walk around in there, it, it won't look exactly the same because there'll be you know subtle tiny little changes. But it'll be so similar that you'll really feel like you're in that space. And if you were to be in the actual space and wearing the glasses and take the headset off, you'll notice the difference. But it would feel very very similar to being in the actual space. Yeah, I've got my little Oculus headset too, and um, and it, it, it uh, you know, I thought it, it, when I got into spatial and then got into alt space, I, I think it's worth, I think it's worth the leaders you know, standing up a, a a project to test this out because I often talk about you know offense and defense innovation, and and you've got to, I I think for example, I was thinking from a sales perspective, it's it's really our cost of sale for for making a sale. Uh, it can be thousands of dollars between the support that's necessary, the travel costs, uh, and in a variety of, of support mechanisms needed to make that that sale. And what would be interesting is to start getting some of the customers into the virtual environment so that presentations can be made and you can engage with that with that customer in a much different way. So I look at that as a kind of an, an offense. I don't know if you've had people ask you for that type of capability. For sales, yeah, I mean, I it's I'm not as familiar with the terms offense and defense, but I'm, I'm I'm I played football a little bit in college, so I, I understand offense and defense. Um, the the uh, we've had some companies have used this technology because they legitimately could not bring their customers and their salespeople together, and so they've hired us to build uh, environments that they use to sell the concept and idea, sending the headsets to their to their customers, and we've been we've been told sales have happened. They've made sales because of it, so that's a good sign. They've come back and brought us additional work, so that's another good good sign that it's working. Um, and, and I think that I think that the argument could be made that it's a different, it's such a different experience, the, the virtual reality experience. Uh, we had something kind of funny happen. I gotta say it. Um, we, we were giving away a, a free Oculus Quest for this at this event. We're trying we're trying to bring people in. We're trying to bring people in, but we also we know that we're going to bring a lot of business people in because it's gonna it's gonna be a tail end networking event for this VARA. Association uh, Enterprise Forum today, and anyone here who's listening, welcome to join us uh, at St. Patrick's Day party on the uh, block party on uh, an alt space. But the giveaway of a three hundred dollar device has brought a lot of people into the space. It was just the kind of a, I guess you call it a lost leader or whatever. But yeah. um, people are emailing me. I can look over here and see you know seven leprechauns. People are telling me um, how many leprechauns that they have found in the environment. We've got a hidden number. And the people who guess the right number will go into a drawing. So far, there's only a couple who have got. You got to tell the you got to tell the whole story though of 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 how, why you built the space and go back to like that, that's a pretty cool story. And then like the gamification you set up within it. Well, I wasn't even expecting the gamification. It just kind of someone threw out the idea and we we did it. But we really we built the space because a few weeks back we built an environment for spatial. Spatial asks us to create a uh, an environment for their 2.0 build party. So we produced this. Um, it was like the 16 balconies area where we had yeah, balconies cool. around the world, New York and London and 
Dubai and Kyoto. And it was, I could list them off, but 16 different cities. You can kind of tour them out. We, we realized at the end, we probably should have pulled it down to like six or eight, but we did 16 because I just wanted to be, I wanted to blow people away with the sheer mass number of them. But anyway, uh, when we finished that environment, uh, my team was like, okay, what should we work on next? And we have some big projects that we're going to be starting here in a few weeks, but we said, we've got some time. Let's go ahead and do something else. Uh, next holiday up is St. Patrick's Day. So we decided to do a St. Patrick's Day party. And, and um, this was also my team had wanted to, to work in a different platform. So we did it in Allspace. And Allspace has got some uh, nice features. You can add additional things like this, the animated effects and you can have a larger audience and those kinds of uh, issues are nice. But there was an idea that someone had said, well, why don't you give away something that'll bring people in? And I think it has for sure. But um, the lady, uh, a couple ladies that have, have emailed me and said, the first one said, I spent an hour and a half in your space looking all around for the, the hidden leprechauns. And I'm not going to say she got it right, but she did good. Um, but, th but, that's, but that was something I thought afterwards, oh my gosh, we've got customers coming to us that are spending an hour and a half in our virtual environment. And we may have 500, maybe a thousand people in there uh, today that will spend anywhere from you know 10 minutes to an hour and a half, maybe more. Yeah. And, and, and what businesses might want to be aware of is you can, if you can get someone to come to your event and spend hours or spend 30 minutes or 40 minutes, and you can make a game out of whatever it is that you're trying to you know, encourage, there's lots of time and, and, and to there to make, uh, inform them about your product, about your service. And I, and, I, and I really am a convert now to the idea of gamification. Like I heard it before, I didn't really get it. And now I go, okay, Gamification. I see how I see how it works. I see how important it is. Well, I was in when I was, you know, in my my headset, and then one of your guys, I was like, "What is this thing about this game?" And is and I, and, I, and he's like, "Oh, well, we put all these leprechauns everywhere," and and he's like, "Come with me." And so he, then he showed me where one was hidden. I'm like, "Oh, I get it now." And he says, yeah. "Take a picture of it," and I'm like, "You can take a picture." And he goes, and I go, "Yeah." So I pointed at it, took a picture. Okay, now it's saved. Now you just then you send them all. Send yep. all these pictures of all yep. these leprechauns to to see if you win the that's prize. Right. So I found myself walking down the street, this little uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day Square, and I'm like looking up at the windows and trying to find the little leprechaun. So it did it did kind of bait me into it. But then you kind of be curious and you explore, and mm -hmm. uh, which led me for for those uh, folks listening, you know, I thought, well, then you could have a vendors, you could have vendor signs, you could have a little private area where you could have like a mastermind sessions. You can, it's just uh, quite interesting. Uh, the creativity you could deploy on this area. And you have, and you can have experts in the field there communicating with, with individuals. And, you know, my son wants me to, my son wants me to get the uh, Dallas Mavericks. He's a big fan of the Dallas Mavericks. Wants me to get them to do a, an event so they can meet their, their stars. And honestly, I've tried to reach out to them. It's a great idea though. I mean, that'll come down the road probably, right? You know, uh, you don't want, especially with COVID, you don't want your star players to be interacting with the fans because, you, you know, the risk of getting someone uh, sick is, 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 is bad. So uh, the idea of meeting famous people, uh, meeting experts in the field, meeting authors of books in virtual reality and talking to them and no one has to get out of there. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. And I'm it's looking great. over right now and I'm seeing the numbers and, and there's another person who's just got the right number. So I've got now three people who have, out of, out of maybe a uh, hundred who have gotten the right number. What I like also, it's a good point that you're looking at that other screen because I think people think you gotta have, you know, the, the, the big headset on to experience it, uh, VR and, and augmented reality, but you can also experience that reality from just a pure browser, correct? Right. That's correct. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and that's 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 from a access, accessibility perspective. I mean, anybody listening on this show should have no problems with accessibility, but the fact of the matter is some people just don't have the time or don't want to take the time to figure out, you know, it's a little bit clunkier to get into the space because it's newer technology, but, um, but that's okay. You can just hit it with a web browser. And I think that's, that's an interesting as well. It, it works as well. Yeah. Um, now what about NFTs? Cause I, I was thinking that from an NFTs and 3d digital objects, secured with blockchain, you could essentially, if you're in the physical world with like making things, you could, or even in the not physical world, you can create these 3D images and then secure them with value and establish value on a blockchain. Um, how does that play into VR moving forward, do you think? It's funny you should ask that question, Bill. Uh, last night, actually, 
night before last, I finished my our, our NFT gallery, and it looks great. I'm really, uh, really happy with it. I will cool. take you in. I put it in space, so I will take you in. Remind me to take you in in a, week, in a day or two. Okay. Um, uh, so a, a collector in Germany reached out to uh, Spatial and said, hey, I really want to have a, a custom virtual reality gallery. The guys at Spatial said, hey, Michael, would you do this? I said, sure. So I built one. It's just our work right now. I'm trying to get my, my work listed because, you know, that's half the work is getting, getting your artwork listed. But um, this is a whole new thing, right? The whole NFTs is, 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 is blowing up. Um, it, is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And to be completely honest, the benefit of looking at your artwork in virtual reality versus um, on your web, it's night and day, night and day. I mean, if I'm looking at a screen and I can see my picture right there, the, the gallery that I put up, I have, um, I think six are pieces of artwork, five or six of them are still and six of them are video. And they, they look like they are, you know, 10 by 10 foot paintings or digital artworks in a gallery. And I'm, I'm not really borrowing anyone's gallery. I'm just kind of taking the concept of a gallery and trying to do a, a somewhat of a, a normal looking uh, art gallery like you'd ex expect it like a high-end you know a uh, momo or a, you know a big big museum like a city museum and um and it is i think it's going to go 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 gangbusters because virtual reality really does make a lot of sense to view it and then the other thing is, is to actually like experience it instead of swiping you can teleport but you can just walk down the aisle and look at the artwork and if once you own that artwork that yeah. can be your art in theory you could even have your you know charge admittance or whatever, but you can certainly keep your collection and show it off in a really, really nice way. And yeah, that doesn't have to be art. It can be, it can be all kinds of digital objects. It can be, you know, digital three baseball cards. Model. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be, be all kinds of stuff. Coins, exactly. You know, I mean, it could be anything, but for those of you that are, that are new to the uh, NFTs, well, we're all new to it, but an uh, NFT stands for non fungible tokens. And it's a, a convergence of technologies of blockchain um, which allows for no middleman to have to uh, establish the value of a uh, of an object, and now we're seeing this uh, establishment of virtual uh, objects, 3D objects that are, are are physical world kind of marrying with definitely the physical world marrying with this uh, digital world and having value with that. So, yeah. And let, me, let me add one thing, I, and this is really kind of an interesting concept that a one company they're called Super Rare, and I'm. A big fan, I am because they're 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 doing great. But they not only they have what's called a, a primary market and a secondary market. So the artist sells his or her own work on the primary market. I think there's a I think the company Super Rare gets fifteen percent or ten percent of the trade. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think it's something like that. But what's interesting is that there's a secondary market. Once uh, art has been sold the first time, the collector can then resell it at, at his or her own will whenever they want to. They can list it at a price, whatever. The interesting part though is that this, this one particular platform gives the artist a 10% of the second sale. So it gives the artist uh, basically a residual uh, payment, just like you would get if you had done the Seinfeld episodes and Seinfeld gets a piece of the, every time they play afterwards. So, um, you know, of course the artists are, you know, gangbusters trying to get in the door to this place because not yeah. only do you make a sale the first time, but you make a little bit every, every time it sells after that. So. It's an interesting technology and it's it's blowing up right now. Yeah, and I, I like it as well because you can take something that is rare in the physical world and um, like, like a painting and you can say, well, I wanna carve this painting into a thousand digital bits and I wanna sell, and someone might wanna take ownership of a fractional share of that of that piece of art, but there's no way to secure that in the physical world. Like, how do you do that? Instead, in the digital world, you can actually assign that on the blockchain, and essentially that is backed up on potentially a thousand computers as far as the ledger of who owns what and what section of that. I, I just I love the concept. I think it's going to change our whole concept of, of owning something. Yeah, I can't wait to take you to the gallery. Yeah, uh, I'm looking I mean, forward I, to that. I, I was working on it at night when my son was sleeping after after a ski trip, and, and it was like, I, I thought, I think this is going to look pretty good, and I was pretty, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. That's neat. Yeah, you'll have to show me that. So, well, uh, uh, what what else what else do you think we need to cover here? Because I know you have um, a book giveaway that that That's right. You, so maybe we should talk about about that because uh, I think we need to get people listening not used used to how and what uh, virtual reality and virtual spaces and how they can enable their businesses. Uh, they have to push the envelope of what's next, and these are some things that 
and uh, I want to introduce you to them. That's really important. So they have an avenue to get things done. Um, but what's what? Talk about this book giveaway. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I I read every book I can on virtual reality, and this one just came out. I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, called Reality Check, from an author, Jeremy Dalton. He is a he's a, a, a virtual reality uh, expert and analyst. I think at uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. I'm not exactly sure what his title is, but uh, he wrote a great book, a very, very uh, useful book on how you can incorporate uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and how businesses are into their, into, uh, their business uh, pipeline, uh, things to look out for, uh, what, you know, what, what kind of technologies you need to be aware of now, what's coming down the road, what to, what to, you know, what to spend your energy on and what to skip. And, and really, as a, as a guy who's been working with virtual reality for 25 years, I, I read this book and I agreed with 99% of what he said in here. And there were some things in here that I just thought, oh, I didn't realize that. That's good. And there were some stuff that I, there were some things where I would tell these anecdotes to my clients and he did the research. And so it wasn't just an antidote. It was, you know, d- data driven information. He did his, he did his homework and I just kind of used my own life experience in virtual reality. So I'm, I'm very happy. I'm giving these probably to almost all my clients. I'll probably give them as Christmas presents and we're giving out 50 today. Uh, to uh, the people at the event. And for your uh, podcast, I thought we talked about this earlier. Yeah. Uh, if you if you get the emails of, of the first five people who yeah. whatever. So email, we'll put it on the on the on the show notes, but Bill M at redzonetech.net. We're gonna make this really easy. Bill M at redzonetech.net. The name of it is Reality Check, How Immersive Technologies Can Transform Your Business by Jeremy Dalton. So we'll send out free 10 copies and uh, and again just make it really simple. Send uh, and I might also add, if you're if you're listening to this on on LinkedIn or on uh, on Twitter, you can just message that account as well. Just message, I'd like a copy of the book, and then we're going to need, of course, your address to ship it to. So, so so that is that. Well, thank you, Michael, for coming on the show today. This has been great. It's been my pleasure. Um, it's part of the, the frontier where we're heading. So it's great to talk to an expert in 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 this area. Thanks for your time, Bill. Okay, until next time. Talk I'll to you see soon. you later. Okay, bye bye.